In the early 70s, Stephanie Rothman, one of the very few female directors at the time, worked for Roger Corman's New World Pictures. After finishing the drama The Student Nurses in 1970, she was looking to do something a little different. She loved all genres of film and wanted to direct as many different types as possible, so she took this opportunity to direct her first horror film. Since horror is almost always in demand, this genre would be the easiest to finance. Stephanie Rothman, her husband Charles Swartz, and Maurice Jules, using a pseudonym, wrote a story called Through the Looking Glass. Jules then wrote the first draft screenplay, which was about a vampire who was watching two of her sleeping victims through a mirror and passed through it to get to them in their dreams. Rothman and Swartz took the screenplay and gave it a rewrite. When rewriting the script, they envisioned it to be more elegant and less gory. This was not going to be the traditional bloodsucker vampire film. Sure, there would be scenes of murder, but there was also a soul to the production, a story that tried to make the vampire a sympathetic villain. The rewrite focused on a vampire, Diane, who meets a young couple in a shadowy art gallery deep in the heart of downtown LA and invites them to stay with her at her isolated home in the desert. She uses her power to seduce both of them and sap their energy, as well as their blood. They wrote her to be alluring, like a lovely purring cat that invites you to pet her and then suddenly scratches and bites. Diane wasn't a typical vampire. She was immortal, but it was seen as stemming from a rare blood disease rather than straight up being the mythical creature. They wanted to give the audience two choices. Is she a monster, or is she a real woman whose vampirism can be explained medically? Either way, she's still a vampire. While the Hammer Horror films were popular at the time, this was going to be a unique take on the usual vampire lore. They set out to make the film both an art film and a horror film, but not at the expense of either one. Charles Swartz had just produced The Student Nurses in 1970, and would be returning to produce Through the Looking Glass. Most of the film was going to revolve around the vampire and the two people staying with her. As such, the cast would be very small. They hired Michael Blodgett to play Lee, and Sherry Miles to play Susan. As for the vampire, Roger Corman introduced Rothman and Swartz to Celeste Yarnell. The duo were really taken by the actress. She had a combination of beauty, intelligence, and magnetism that was needed for the role. Yarnell had been in numerous TV shows like The Man From U.N.C.L.E. and Hogan's Heroes. She's now largely known for her role in the Star Trek episode, The Apple. She took the role because she really liked the script and was happy to be working with a female director. While Yarnell was happy to be on the project, it was also a big deal for her. Her previous film, Beast of Blood, was filmed while she was three months pregnant, and after having the baby, it was eight months before she was able to get another audition. She needed work, and luckily, it was a job that she was glad to be doing. They started filming in the winter of 1971 on a budget of around $165,000. Since the budget was low, they planned to film the entirety on location rather than build sets. The locations were Joshua's Tree National Park and the Devil's Playground Dunes in the Mojave Desert. They also rented a house in downtown L.A. where most of the production would take place. While the Hammer Horror films at the time were shot at night in enclosed spaces like castles, this film was made to stand out differently from the other vampire films. It was shot mostly during the day, with many open exterior locations, which really was quite different at the time. To keep from burning every time they shot in the desert, the cast and crew smothered themselves in sunscreen. They had to be extra careful with their lead because she was very fair-skinned, and everything would go out the window if all of a sudden the vampire had sunburn. Yarnell was a natural blonde who became a brunette for the film, which is funny because it's usually the opposite. Earlier in her career, Yarnell had turned down roles with nudity. However, when she was offered Beast of Blood, she was in a position financially where she could no longer afford to say no. She also agreed to do the nudity in The Velvet Vampire, and was happy she was able to do it in a way that was classy, not gratuitous. The nudity was scary for the actress, since she had just stopped breastfeeding her daughter and was self-conscious about her baby weight. She trained right up until filming and lost about 8 pounds. Whenever it was time to do a nude scene, Rothman ordered it to be a closed set. They scaled everything back to one camera operator and one lighting technician to make it comfortable for the actress, and the actor as well, since he was also nude in some scenes. During this nude scene, it was physically uncomfortable for Blodgett. According to Yarnell, his manhood was held back with gaffer tape, and at one point it moved, which caused the tape to rip. In the film, there's a scene where the vampire lays nude next to a man who's supposed to be her husband. The actress was very nervous about doing it with a stranger, so she asked the director if she could do the scene with her friend, who was a member of the crew. They agreed, and it made it much more comfortable for everyone involved. 
While the production went off mostly without a hitch, they ran into something they weren't expecting while in the desert. The weather would change at a moment's notice. It would go from hot and sunny one second to ominously dark because of a sudden sandstorm. Everyone had to run for cover and protect the equipment so it didn't get thrashed in the storm. This made it very difficult to match the lighting from shot to shot, which interrupted the flow of filming. The scene in the desert where Diane walks through the mirror was a very clever camera trick. This was done by superimposing two shots. First, a shot of the empty frame was made, and then a shot of Celeste walking through it. It ends up being seamless and was very impressive for such a small production. The liver in the film was raw chicken. The actress said it wasn't all that bad, as long as she swallowed it without chewing. Yarnell doesn't drink, so the wine in the film was grape juice. Whenever Diane would feed, they'd put lipstick on her lower eyelids to give her an otherworldly look. The big chase at the end was shot in an L.A. bus station. They shot there for one day, and it was mostly empty. Although when Susan's running from Diane, they're dodging real passengers. In the end, Diane is swarmed by a mob when Susan outs her as a vampire. The director wanted to leave it ambiguous as to why she was killed. She was definitely not a normal human since she had been alive and young for so long. So in this world, perhaps they didn't recognize what a vampire was and just saw this as a blood disease. The audience also gets to decide how Diane dies. Was she frightened to death by the blinding sun and cross-waving mob? Or did she die by the traditional vampire lore of the spiritual power of the cross? In the beginning of the film, Diane is seen to be in control, but by the end, her demise is meant to inspire pity. She's helpless and in pain, brought down by forces greater than her, the sun and the cross. When Diane's dying, they had an eye doctor come in and give her red contact lenses. Yarnell said they were so painful it was almost impossible for her to keep her eyes open. She remembered hearing the director shouting, Celeste, open your eyes! She did open them long enough to get the shot so they could move on. Filming ended after about 18 days. Yarnell said it was hard being away from her baby for so long, but her nanny was able to bring her to the set for visits. Rothman and Swartz had previously made two films for Corman, so he trusted their judgment and left them alone during the production to make the film they wanted to make. While in post-production, Roger Corman and his partner, Larry Woolner, thought the name The Looking Glass was too generic for the film. They needed the title to clearly express that it was a vampire film, so it was changed to The Velvet Vampire. They edited the film and had a sneak preview. Overall, Corman liked it, but asked the director to go back and add some more violence to one scene, which she did. The movie was released into theaters in the fall of 1971. It was later released in the UK under the alternate title, The Waking Hour. Rothman and Swartz had left New World for Dimension, so they weren't privy to the box office totals. They were told it did average numbers. It was later a staple in drive-in theaters as a double feature with a variety of other smaller budgeted films. Reviews were mostly positive. Yarnell took her mother to see the film at a drive-in theater. She joked that her mother practically disowned her. When she saw the nudity, she said, Celeste, how could you? After the film, Corman had offered Yarnell another role in one of his films that was ready to be shot in Costa Rica. She had to turn it down because she was already offered a role in the Charles Bronson film, The Mechanic. The offer United Artists gave her for The Mechanic was a small role that could potentially turn into a lead role in another film. Unfortunately, Corman never approached her for another film after that. She was sad because she really enjoyed working with him and had hoped to do more. Rothman and Swartz left New World after this to join Dimension Pictures, which I discuss in further detail in my video on Terminal Island. Michael Blodgett continued acting in TV shows like Electra Woman and Dinah Girl before moving into writing. He wrote the Chuck Norris action film The Hero and the Terror, the Tom Hanks and lovable dog movie Turner and Hooch, and the very underappreciated Patrick Dempsey and Kelly Preston movie Run. Sherry Miles had small parts in Police Woman and the Partridge Family before leaving the industry in 1979. Celeste Yarnell continued acting in movies like Fatal Beauty and TV shows like Melrose Place. In the late 90s, she shifted away from acting and worked to get a PhD in nutrition. Her focus was on animals, and she wrote two best-selling books, Natural Cat Care, A Complete Guide to Holistic Care for Cats, and Natural Dog Care, A Complete Guide to Holistic Care for Dogs. The Velvet Vampire fell into obscurity, but had a revival every time it hit a new medium. New fans discovered it on VHS, then again on DVD, and now Blu-ray. Knowledge of the film and interest has only grown over time, and it's more popular now than it was all the way back then. It's still a lesser-known title, but thanks to home video, it was saved from being forgotten. 
Years after the film was released, Yarnell discovered there was a cult following for the film. When she was at conventions to sign Star Trek memorabilia, there was always a demand for her to sign something from the Velvet Vampire. Quentin Tarantino even owns one of the rare 35mm prints of the film, and occasionally he'll show it as part of his collection. The Velvet Vampire is a unique take on the subject. It has lots of elements of exploitation, such as a fair amount of sex and violence, but also has a vibe that makes it feel like an art house film. That's not a bad thing. This could very well be the first, or at least one of the very few, movies that bridges the gap between exploitation and art house. It was refreshing to hear of an executive producer who trusted the director enough to let them make their film. Offering suggestions afterward is fine, but too many executives hire a director for a job and then do nothing but override their decisions. Celeste Yarnell was stunning in this, and is also one of the reasons why the film works so well. She exudes grace and power in an almost hypnotic performance. You could see why both Lee and Susan were unable to control themselves around her. It's a shame the director wasn't able to do more films, but I respect her decision to stop when she did. Rothman recognized that exploitation films did have certain requirements, which she was able to combine with her own particular flair. She took something that could have been trash under someone else and managed to weave it into a lovely-looking tale of tragedy. As of currently, three of the director's films have been restored and are being preserved in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. Her last two will make their way over there as well, but the negatives have been lost, which is making the process take much longer. It's wonderful to know the films will have a good home, and because of this, it'll be able to be enjoyed by future generations, rather than lost to time. Rothman is definitely a trailblazer in the industry, and while many folks will snub their nose at something like the Velvet Vampire, I appreciate it for being beautiful and different. You're not exactly a nature lover, Diane. Oh, I am. But it can hurt you, the sun, if you let it. <laughs>